Good morning and welcome to Lake Travis United Methodist Church Worship Online. We are a community of online believers that come together to explore all that God really has for us and love, to understand our identity and the way that we move out into the world. This morning we celebrate a classic Christian holiday uh, known as Pentecost. It is a celebration of the Holy Spirit or the idea of God's presence with us. And uh, we are excited about all of that. If you're new to us or if you haven't had an opportunity to connect with us before, we'd encourage you to go to the front page of our website. And what you'll find is a connection form. And on that connection form, if you'll just fill it out, we'll get back to you this week and help you get connected with all the information. You can also sign up for the newsletter and just kind of find out everything that's going on. We're increasingly thinking of ourselves as having sort of an online campus as well as having an in-person campus. Speaking of which, it is looking like increasingly we'll be opening for the possibility uh, of in-person worship together on the 14th. We'll see as we watch closely together and pray about all of that. What I'll also tell you is that if you'd like to give, and so many of you have been incredibly generous and helped us in so many spectacular ways during this time, um, that we're just incredibly grateful for all of that. But if you'd like to do that, the safest and best and most effective way for us to do that is, again, to go to the website, find that piece where it says uh, give, uh, sign up, and uh, make that uh, a part of your life either for one time or for an ongoing deal. It helps us to continue to be creative, to reach out into the world with the message of Jesus Christ. We're excited that you're here. So what we'd encourage you to do now is to rest back, relax, um, and really just enjoy the time that we have together, even though we're apart. Welcome to church. Good morning and welcome Lake Travis Church. Um, we are so excited that you decided to tune in this morning. I just want for the next like 20 minutes for this to be a place where you can feel seen and known and pursued by a God who created the universe. And I just encourage you to just take stock of what God has given you, the people around you, the family that you have, um, and allow this service to um, transform you to see them more clearly and love them more fully. Um, and, uh, would you worship with us just as we sing a couple songs? and? read a text um, and you're just invited to take part in what God is doing today Nothing worth 
so bad We come here in your presence now We lay it all before you at your feet God, may we surrender to your presence, Holy Spirit. Be with us, be in us. May we be vessels of your love in this world, Lord. May your spirit shine through us and work through us, Lord. We know that you are working here in this place, here in our nation, here in our global community, God. Even when we don't think you're working, you are, you're here. You are with us and you are for us and you are healing and you are loving with your great arms, with your great love. God, we just, we pray that you enter into us now, that you enter into the lives of those who are grieving and suffering, Lord. May you be with them. May you walk with them step by step. God, just fill us up. Fill up our cup. We love you so desperately, Lord. Help us to be there for each other. Help us to be stewards of your love. May you remind us that we are our brother and sister's keepers. You have called us to take care of one another. May you just be in us, Lord. We love you, and we trust you with all that we are, God. In your name, amen. Before the Israelites left Babylon, the king of Persia, who had overthrown Babylon, decided to help them rebuild the temple back in Jerusalem. He organized people from all over the land to give livestock and supplies to the Israelites. He even returned all of the gold and silver that the Babylonians had stolen from the temple. 50,000 Israelites returned to Jerusalem and rebuilt the altar of the temple then laid the foundation for the building itself. Before the temple was even finished, the Israelites began to offer sacrifices and worship God in it once again. But other countries surrounding Jerusalem began to worry about the Israelites regaining power. So they sabotaged the rebuilding project, and it came to a standstill for 16 years. But God used two men, Haggai and Zechariah, to encourage the Israelites to resume building the temple and not to be afraid of their enemies. So they continued building, strengthened by the prophet's words. The opposition continued, this time from a man named Tatanai, the governor of a nearby region. He wanted to stop the Israelites from building and worked to convince the Persian king, Darius, to stop the Israelites. Not only did King Darius not stop the rebuilding project, he threatened Tatanai and anyone else who would try to stop the temple from being rebuilt, that he would kill them. Then he made Tatanai give funding, animals, and supplies to the Israelites. So the work continued, and almost 70 years after it had been destroyed, the Israelites finished rebuilding the temple. They dedicated it by sacrificing hundreds of animals to God and returning the priests back to their positions of leadership in the temple. God was once again worshipped in Jerusalem.
Amen. My name is Jordan. I get to be the youth pastor here. Uh, and what a great reminder as we enter into a time uh, where the, we say the Shema, which is a Hebrew prayer that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, that it is just one more way in which we can come to the altar of God. It's this prayer. It's a declaration that reminds us that our God is the one who moves. Our God is the one who transforms through love and we get to know him and we get to experience him. And so when we say the Shema together, we are reminding ourselves of that as we as a family come before the altar of God. So I would encourage you to stand uh, and say it with strength. We're going to say a little bit uh, in phonetic Hebrew, and then we'll say the rest in English. We say this because it's a practical way of putting Jesus's words on our lips, and we want to become more and more like Jesus in this lifetime. So we say it together. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Our scripture today comes from Ezra chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. It says this, When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. Then Joshua, son of Jozadak, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, come on, uh, and his associates began to build an altar of the God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both in the morning and the evening sacrifices. Then according to what, in accordance to what was, with what was written, they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles with the required number of burnt offering prescribed for each day. After that, they presented the regular burnt offerings, the new moon sacrifices, and the sacrifices for all the appointed sacred festivals of the Lord, as well as those brought as free will offerings to the Lord. On the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, though the foundation of the Lord's temple had not yet been laid. Then they gave money to masons and carpenters and gave food and drink and olive oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre so that they would bring cedar logs by the sea from Lebanon to Joppa as authorized by Cyrus, king of Persia. In the second month of the second year after their arrival in the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtel, and Joshua, son of Jozadak, and the rest of the people, the priests and the Levites, and all who had returned from captivity to Jerusalem began to work. They appointed Levites 20 years old and older to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. Joshua and his sons and brothers uh, and Cadmiel and his sons, descendants of Hadavia, uh, and the sons of Hanadad and their sons and brothers, all Levites joined together in supervising those working on the house of God. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord, as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good. His love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise because of the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. These are the very words of God. Amen. Go ahead and be seated uh, in your couches, or if you were standing in your car, it's impressive. Uh, but let's, um, let's talk a little bit about the, the really beautiful and amazing 
uh, scripture that we have uh, in front of us this morning. It comes from the book, of course, of Ezra. I, I feel like Jordan did an, a brilliant job of actually getting that thing read. It's not too easy to read some of those names, and he kind of nailed it. Uh, so I would just encourage you to just kind of remember where we are in the larger scope of this story. If you have been following along with us, we've been going through the Bible, uh, kind of one narrative story at a time through a book of the narrative version of the Bible called The Story. You're welcome to continue to uh, join us. And also we'll be picking up the New Testament on the other side of the summer. But this morning we, we really begin with this focus on Ezra and this incredible moment in human history that must have been mind-blowing uh, for the Israelites, those the the, the actual, they're from Judah and Benjamin, the tribes, that's where they get the name Jew, is from Judah. Uh, so really the Jews that have been off in exile in Babylon and now through these different kings, Nebuchadnezzar, Darius we met last week with Daniel, and now uh, we're here with Cyrus. And Cyrus is this fascinating moment because when he comes up onto the scene as they have been oppressed now for almost fully 70 years and kind of integrated and all these things that have been tough, Cyrus comes out and says, not only are you free, but I give you permission, funding, and protection to go back to where you're from in Jerusalem and build a temple to your God. I'll even empty out all of the things that Nebuchadnezzar took from you, stole from you, over 5,000 things, it says in the Bible. They return to the Jews to return back to Jerusalem to then build up that temple. I don't I don't know who would have believed that story except a group of people that had been enslaved by a, a large nation that when it was time for them to leave, they actually also had the entire nation give them things to just leave and get out and go uh, and, and find the promised land in that moment. And so here they are again in this kind of return, in this kind of chorus that seems to be coming around that says, in the middle of all this oppression and all this enslavement and all this, there's no possible way we could ever break out. God moves in extraordinary ways, frees them, funds them, and then leads them to build the thing that they had been missing. I love the story. But there's something really fascinating about this moment. Something that's really strange, and it brings me to a few thoughts, and so here they are. First is this. Years ago, uh, I woke up on a Saturday morning, and I knew that I had a really strange day in front of me. In fact, when I woke up, I don't know if you ever do this, but you wake up and you figure out what day it is, and then you start downloading the things that are in front of you. And I knew that because of the week previous, that that day was going to be very difficult for me. I had in the morning a funeral of a friend, someone that I had uh, watched be, come close to me and my family, become a wise voice in my life. Uh, and then I watched him slowly fade and die over a period of time. Pretty close to the family. And I had spent some time with them the pre two previous days. And so that morning we were going to bury him. We were going to celebrate him and everything that came with it. And I knew that that was going to start at about 10. And then once that was uh, completed and we had the lunch and um, did all the things that came with that, there would be kind of this small break for me to come home and get ready because that evening I had a huge wedding of some folks that I really loved, that I had seen them. I was around when they met. I'm not going to say introduce them to each other, but you know, uh, maybe I did. And then ultimately they were going to get married. They were very happy, very nervous, very faithful, very sweet. It was a very big wedding and everybody was really excited about it. And, and so I knew that this was my day. And, and here's what I noticed across the course of that day. It's something that I didn't expect because I had never had the intensity of my own personal emotion engaged both in the morning in a funeral and in the evening in a wedding in such a way. And what I noticed is that funerals and weddings are not really that different. And before you do a series of ridiculous jokes about that, what I want to tell you is that the human experience at both a funeral and a wedding combines two fascinating things. It combines a ton of laughter and joy when you're at a funeral. Believe it or not, some of the heartiest laughs of all time are told when you retell the stories of someone that you have known and loved. And also the incredible tears at that same time of missing them. 
You could be at a wedding, and, and at a wedding, you'll, you'll hear the laughter of nerves and uncomfort, and also the same kind of things, the stories where parents or grandparents are telling stories, hoping to embarrass their grandkid or just to remember them, and just the excitement that comes with it. And then, if you're careful, you can see a father tear up, a mother wipe away her pride and her joy. And so at the end of this day, I remember laying in bed again, looking at the ceiling, thinking a handful of things. One is, when you're a pastor, you have amazing seats to the most beautiful things. And also, weeping and laughing very often live in the same place. This is an important part of this scripture, is, is all of that imagery. Uh, in fact, what happens here is they, they get that, that, that thing, that whole you know, freedom from Cyrus, and, and they're going in. And I can imagine at that moment that there's this kind of vacuum of what they have known, what they had expected, what they had hoped for. We need to get back. Everything's going to be great. And then all of a sudden when they're given it, there is this tension of how are we going to do that? Is this real? How can we be safe? Are we sure? And there must have been weeping at people that were leaving the things that they had grown to love and at the same time laughter at the joy that they were leaving. They must have gotten to Jerusalem and had that same kind of thing happening. When they get there, it's, it's great because one of the first things that they do, it says, and it lists the people, and I always love it when it lists the people, uh, not because I'm, I even know who they are, although maybe I will someday, but there's this kind of beautiful expectation that I can have when there are these people that are named, and they each have these jobs to recognize that God calls the regular folk, just like you and me, to do the extraordinary thing that sits right in front of you. Whatever it is that sits right in front of you that is the extraordinary that only belongs to you, it kind of comes with that whole idea of if not you, who? If not now, when? That's a phrase that I grew up with, and I'd, I'd have to say it, it's, it's regularly in my mind and heart. I, I think that they, they do that. They start to fill in all the different roles that they have, and and it says that they kind of get themselves established. They find a house. They've made this journey. They're still coming out of this oppression and enslavement and everything that came with it. And they get about to business. And I love what they do. They immediately, in the face of all of this kind of struggle that they have been in the middle, the first thing that they do is not build a wall around it to make it safe. The first thing that they do is not sort of divide up who's going to do what. They, 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 they have a little bit of it, but there's this kind of picture. The very first thing that they do is they want to do the thing that has been coming up out of them the whole time. What they want to do is be in and experience the presence of God. That's what happens right here at the beginning of Ezra. Don't mistake it. What they do is they light the fire of sacrifice. And for us, that's a really foreign and strange thing. But in the Bible, fire almost always symbolizes the presence of God. If there is fire in the story of Scripture, it is God's presence almost every time. And so what essentially happens is it's the, the altar fire that comes uh, and that is an image of the smoke that rises from that fire and from the sacrifices that are on it. It's a, a picture of forgiveness, of everything that comes with it. And God's presence is with us again. A freedom to, for, to freely worship and to be right in the middle of that is with them again. And what I want to talk about this morning is the actual experience of God's presence. I think that that's the first and last and middle thing that we need to be worried about right now. Some of us are wound up about whether we should or shouldn't be in church or how we should do this or why this thing is happening. And what I want to say is they don't even care about a building. They don't even initially build the foundation. The only thing that they're interested in right away, even though it says they are afraid for their lives, for the people that are around them that they are pushing out, is they want to be in the presence of God. 
And I ask myself, when is the last time that I was desperate to be in the presence of God? When's the last time that it would be, I, I would push everything out of the way and make that the very first thing that I did? And the truth is, I can't remember a time I was desperate. Not like that. Not like with that kind of intensity. Not with that kind of fire. There have been times when I have needed it so deeply that it had to overwhelm me like Elijah. There have been times when it has scooped me up and kind of empowered my voice and way and such a, that I just can't even, it's amazing. In this country and in others, there are even times when I can say that, that I've just loved so deeply to be sunk down into the silent places of God's heart that I felt totally at home, totally loved, totally healed. But I have this feeling that since they were kept from it for so long, they just must have erupted in God's presence. What I like to say to us is like, of all the things we want right now, of all the things we miss right now, is it God's presence we want and miss the most? I love it. The, the idea is ultimately completely uh, counterintuitive to us, by the way, because um, God does this thing where God is God-centered, which is weird. But God is God-centered. Here's why. Because God is pure love. So he knows by very nature that if love is the center of everything, then love will find a way to make and reconcile and redeem all things that are around it. It's the most powerful and transformative thing in the world. And they have a lot of work to do. They have a lot of transformation to make. In fact, uh, what's interesting is you begin to think about what it means to be a people that are oppressed or enslaved. It's really, really hard to go from, okay, fine, you're free, to actually understanding your identity as a free person. This is the work of God's presence. This is the work of love that lets you make mistakes and come back and turn around. I, I, I don't know that we always kind of feel that and know that, but it's true. And so that's exactly what they're working on right here is finding that. In fact, I, I read something earlier this week that I thought was really quite brilliant. It said, if we don't have healing for our fears or our wounds, they get transmitted. So in, instead of them being transmitted, they have to be transformed. In other words, if you have things in your life that are wounds, fears, uglinesses, you will transmit them to the people that you love and the people that you are around. Your fears will become theirs. Your wounds will become theirs. Your rhythms, your, the tapes in your head will become theirs. Your children's, your grandchildren's. They will be transmitted unless they are transformed. And what I want to suggest to you is that the way that they are transformed over and over in the Bible is with love. The presence of God transforms the things that we need the most. Not as much policy, not as much yelling, but complete, radical, self-sacrificial love is what transforms everything in an enduring way. Fascinated uh, with the whole idea uh, of not letting the things that, that get into me actually be transmitted, but to be transformed and in that present place. And so I start to say, well, how do you do that, right? Like, how do you, if that's true, if God comes over and over and over and forgiveness and constant, and I'm, I mean, we've seen this so regularly, and now he's bringing them back again. Like, how is it that we can be, it, it can, we can experience the presence of God so that it can transform us set us free to the fullest version of ourselves so that those things aren't transmitted, but we can actually have freer and more beloved children and friends around us and that our life can have the kind of purpose and meaning that we, we hoped that it would and we know deep inside that it could. How do you do it? I love uh, Brother Lawrence. I don't know if, if you know who Brother Lawrence is. He's a monk, a 17th century Carmelite monk and a really simple guy. Um, one of the things that he, he wrote uh, quite beautifully is a book called Practicing the Presence of God. Now, what's great about um, him is that his job early on in the monastery was not to be the writer or to be the preacher or to be the singer or anything like that. 
Um, what he was is his job was to clean the kitchen, and he became really good at it. In fact, he, he had a realization one day as he was cleaning each piece. He would cook, prepare, serve, and clean in the kitchen. That was his job. And so Brother Lawrence decided somehow through the Holy Spirit, whatever it was, that what he wanted to do is not complain about the low station that he might have felt in this lonelier place in the kitchen in the monastery of France. What he wanted to do was dedicate each tiny thing he did to the presence and to the glory of God. He began to practice this and wrote an entire book. And generally, that's the whole thing, which is good. It's both thin, paperback, simple, and cheap, easy to read, but profoundly difficult to follow. Sounds a lot like Jesus, right? My yoke is easy, my, but here he is, Brother Lawrence. And what he did was he made sure that he put everything into every detail of what he did as a way of practicing the presence of God. I can tell you for sure that this is both a challenging discipline and a profoundly transformative one. It's one that I kind of remember every once in a while. You know what I'm talking about? You have like these things that are like, oh yes, I don't know where that went. It slipped away from me and then it returns gratefully. This is one for me. And here's the question. It's simple. But what would it be if everything we did, every conversation we had, Every text we sent, every email we shaped, every conversation we engaged in, we imagined to be to the glory of God as we practiced his presence in our lives. Imagine how things would change. For Brother Lawrence, not only did it change the way he served in the kitchen, it changed the way that the world has thought and that book has sold an unbelievable amount generation after generation. Imagine that there would be a monk in a little monastery in the middle of 17th century France that was in charge of cleaning the dishes that you would be hearing about right now. Just because he did everything he could to the glory of God. Practicing God's presence all the time. Because here's the truth, what Ezra uh, discovers, what, what the whole story of the Bible is God pursues us, as we've talked about it over and over, is that we do this funny thing sometimes in church where we'll, so we'll invite the Holy Spirit in, or we'll talk about this kind of stuff, and, and we'll at the same time know that God is there before we got there, God's there while we're there, and God will be there after. Like, he's constantly there. But if we, if we don't actually practice it, engage it, say yes to it, then we can fade from it. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is, is, is talked about uh, in that way. And this morning as we talk about uh, this fire that is being rebuilt in the middle of Jerusalem, we are celebrating Pentecost. And that is the time uh, when the Spirit of God in flames, by the way, at uh, Pentecost actually comes on all of the disciples and 3,000 uh, new folk uh, right there in that moment incredibly powerful moment. Uh, and so there's this, this kind of piece of us that says, like, this is a real thing for you and for me, that that fire that was the symbol of God in the temple comes out onto each and every one of us. And in that moment, what that means is that God's presence is always with us. Maybe it's a little bit like, um, like a pilot light, you know, like a little blue pilot light that sits in the stove of your house or in the heater, the furnace. And it sits there, blue and glowing. For you, it might feel like that. It's blue. You know it's there. But it's not really shaping your life. Sometimes it might even be easy to forget. But then something will come along and, and breathe into that fire and it will rise up into you and you will have this experience of knowing God's presence with such fullness and clarity as you look out across a mountain range or into the eyes of your child or in a moment where you know for sure that you are telling people what they need to hear from the God that loves them is that his presence is with you now wherever you are. It will always 
be with you. He will pursue you to the end of the earth, to the end of your life and beyond it. And all we need do is turn toward it to experience it in every single aspect in our life. And as we do that, the clarity of our identity and our walk will become so simple and obvious and easy that we'll know exactly how and what to do and to be in this world. But it takes discipline and it takes walk. Like those Africans, those African, almost American, I almost said African Americans, but I'm not sure they would, they would feel that way. When, when the Emancipation Proclamation is actually declared, so many of them are still slaves. And I have to say, just as a just as an aside, I don't know where you are politically with all this stuff with Ahmad Arbery or George Floyd, but I'm just broken hearted. Just broken. What in the world? Where's our freedom? Where's our love? I don't know. If my daughter shows me that video again, our prayers need to be transforming. Our lives need to be transformational. Every tiny thing that we do needs to be to the glory of God. If those things creep into us, they must be removed. We must do all of the work in our own hearts so that that is an eradicated memory. And the church should lead it. We are a people about freedom, not oppression. It is the constant story of the Bible. And the Emancipation Proclamation was declared. There was slaves everywhere that were free and they didn't know it and they didn't know how to walk it out. What I'm trying to say to us today is you are free. You are free to walk out into the freedom that has been delivered unto you. You are given a choice to now say, I'm going to practice the presence of God in an everyday way so that I could actually be the person that I am called and created to be or not. And I, I don't mean, yes, I do actually mean to be a little hard about this. We, we have an opportunity right now to lead and to be the people that we're created to be. Not to cower, but to remain silent. All of this that we're doing in our lifetimes is an invitation to you and me where we are. To we're called to be. And this is the, the point, is that the, then the Holy Spirit comes upon us in Pentecost. That fire comes up inside of us. That opportunity to rise up and be the people of God. If you are alone in your house and you're thinking, how can I do that? Pray, reach out, look online, take part in loving people that don't know that they are loved. Find a way to make sure every Every one of us has an opportunity to do this. This is the story of Ezra, a story that comes in and says, we're going to establish God's presence before we establish any kind of safety. We're going to establish God's presence even before we lay a foundation. We're going to be about God's presence because that is the only thing we really need to focus on. And once that presence, like a fire, rises up in the love that we are to be transformed in, we actually have a shot to be the people that we're called and created to be. I love the idea, the hope and the reality that Jesus Christ is the best example and living guide in this lifetime. We are called to be like him and he will lead us to do so. That is the picture of the presence of God. Hearing him, it being normal and being just impassioned with the hope of the world. Whatever you find uh, this week, this time, this lifetime, this moment. Do everything that you can this week, this day, this hour, this minute to practice the presence of God. Begin your day and end it. And watch how little tiny decisions create in you quite the fire. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, would you light us on fire with your presence? <laughs> would you help us to know how we might 
sort of kindle in our homes right now, ready to kind of come out when that time is right for us and that you would allow us to, to be a voice for the voiceless and that you would help us to be so deeply loved that we just couldn't stand that other people might not be. And help us, Father, remove all of the ridiculous so that we might see clearly what love might, might truly be. Father, we come into your presence now and I would ask that wherever my friends are that can hear, hear our, our worship today, that they would know right now an experience of your presence, an experience of your love. Transform us in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is given for you. On that same night, Jesus lifted the cup and he said, this is the cup of a new covenant. This is the cup of my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. He told us to eat that bread and to drink that cup and to remember him. And so would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we would ask that you would come upon us now, that your presence would come upon us wherever we may be, that we would know you in a deep and profound way, that people that had never experienced you tangibly before would, and people that had fallen away would be reminded, and people that were comfortable and confident in your presence would receive a new and refreshing space, Father. We ask that your blessing would be upon this bread and this wine, that it might be like your presence within us. Help it to transform us so that we might increasingly be the people that we're called to be. In Jesus' name, amen. We take the bread and the cup. We're grateful for this, Father, this gift that we receive. We ask that you would connect us not only to each other, but to all Christians all around the world. Help us to know our citizenship in this kingdom so that we might be the people that we are called to be in the time that we are called to do it. We ask all this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. We hope this week that you've been uh, challenged and encouraged by our time together. Ezra is a powerful uh, and contemporary story as any. Uh, it's an incredible thing to begin to think about what's happening. Next week, we're talking about Esther, one of the great epic stories of the Bible. You will not want to miss out on that. I pray that this week uh, you have an increasingly healthy and engaging week, not only with those that you love, but also the world that is around you. And as we go, would you receive this blessing? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In Jesus' holy and precious name we go. Amen.